Chapter 2, Chapter 2, Workforce Safety and Wellness. Uh, this is Part 1. Uh, this is still part of the preparatory phase of this class, first of the seven modules. And what we're going to cover in here is stress management, infectious diseases, as well as scene control. So all of these topics we're going to look at. Uh, with it, infectious diseases, we'll kind of touch on medicine and the, and the medical part of this and we'll be aware of uh, treating all patients as if they have an infectious disease. That's probably the best way to look at it. That way you're wearing your gloves, you're washing your hands, uh, you're looking at you know, what your personal protective equipment is that you need to have, as well as how to decontaminate equipment after treating the patient. Um, so you have to realize this is not just, uh, you know, we're going to learn some stuff and it's all going to be nice and in the classroom there's no blood, there's no mess, nobody vomits, nobody poops their pants, nothing like, no, in the real world this all happens. Uh, people die and in smaller communities it probably hits you harder because you know these people. But that's why you did this. You wanted to take this class to help people. Um, so we want to be aware of that. As an EMR, you want to keep yourself in good physical shape, and that doesn't only mean, you know, the ability to leap, crawl, climb, bend, stoop, all this kind of stuff, work in low lights and all, but it's also keeping yourself healthy, not only physically, uh, but emotionally, understanding uh, the stressors that you're going to engage in. We have to learn how to avoid unnecessary stress. Uh, and that's a number of ways I like this chapter because it includes a lot of things on wellness, uh, including exercise and, and eating right. I hate to use the word diet, but eating right. Uh, the most stressful calls that you're going to have are probably those that involve kids. Uh, traumatic things happen and people think, well, if only we would have done this, if only I'd have locked that gate, if only I would have put them in a seat belt or a car seat, if only, if only, if only, but you can't go back and undo it. Uh, and again, you may not always change the outcome, but you'll be there to make it maybe a little bit better for them um, overall. Sometimes they're stressful because it's dangerous. There's violence, there's mass, mass casualties that you have to deal with, and that's why in the course you get the tools to take it step by step. We will say things like ABCs or 1, 2, 3 or OPQRST, and all of these mean something to help you gather information uh, to know whether or not uh, you're in over your head. And all you can do is what you can do. Um, there's some things that you can't um, manage in the field. So you have to make a conscious effort to think about these things. Adjust your lifestyle, uh, learn about services and resources that are available to you, and look at signs and symptoms not only in yourself but in your partner and others. Normal reactions to stress. So at some point, you will probably be involved in a call where, where somebody has either uh, died or they are dying. And these are the normal reactions to stress. Um, you may have to knock on somebody's door with law enforcement and wake somebody up in the middle of the night to tell them that their son that was out um, you know, drinking and driving or whatever went off the road, fell asleep, went off the road and rolled his uh, truck and now he's dead. And, uh, you'll watch that family take a step back. The first thing they say is, no, not me, he's in bed asleep. Let me go get him up. And that denial is a very conscious uh, reaction. Anger is a second one. Um, you may tell, turn and tell somebody, I'm sorry, your, your wife of 50 years has um, died in her sleep and there's nothing we can do. And, and the husband may react very angrily, you know, angry and take it out on you yelling at you because you didn't do anything, but that's a normal reaction. Uh, people may bargain. Okay, okay, it's me, but what if we tried? What if this? They think by doing that we can postpone death and dying. Uh, some people sink into a deep depression. Um, and, you know, this may last for months or even years with people, so it's not something that they're going to just pass through. I'm so sad and I'm better. I have completely accepted that this person is gone. Uh, not everybody goes through all these stages of reaction. Um, sometimes they, you know, they go right to, well, we've kind of been expecting it and, um, you know, he's better off this way or whatever. Um, be comfortable in reassuring people. It's okay to give them a hug. I know uh, my nephew's wife died a week after she delivered 
um, her last baby, her third one, uh, she had a C-section, and from complications of that, she died in her sleep. And um, my nephew called my sister, lived in the same town, and, and she rushed over, and fire EMS was already there, and there was nothing they could do. She had already died in her sleep. She was very young, and you know, 32 years old. And it was tragic. Her three young kids were there. Um, but my sister was so surprised um, that the firemen hugged her. They said, we didn't know you did that. I'm like, wow, what, you know, what are we, just like robots? No, of course we do that. Um, again, nothing changed the outcome of that, but in the end, that's something that they remember. That's something that they held on to was that compassion. So kind of keep that in mind. Be careful not to say the wrong things like, oh, they're in a better place now. You know, you don't know that. You've been in their life for five minutes. So, you know, be very careful about not trying to console and using words that mean something to you, but don't comfort them at all. As well as actually saying the words, I'm sorry, but they're dead. Uh, some people will say, you know, they've passed. Well, what does that mean? Uh, they're no longer with us. Did you take the body somewhere? So, you know, you have to be direct uh, and use words that they understand. We'll talk a little bit about stress management, some warning signs that you uh, may exhibit that, uh, you know, you're in over your head. And for the most part, it's uh, reliving that. Everybody's going to have those those few calls that just stay with you forever no matter what you do. Um, but there's things that you can do to, to um, kind of relieve yourself of, and I don't want to say guilt, you didn't do anything con to contribute it, um, but more so anything else, the fact that it's okay. My role in there was this. It's not my emergency. And, and from this, it, you know, it will get better. A lot of um, st um, stress factors that could come into play for most people, you know, they do quite well with this because it's a team approach. So the team absorbs that and we're, and we're good for each other. You know, we talk about the call that we had um, afterwards and, and we like to do kind of a hot wash on every call. Uh, well, how do you think that went? What went well? What could we have done better? Um, you know, anything like that that kind of helps us talk about it right away. And then we go back to doing whatever it was we were doing. And if it still bugs you, you know, you need to, to report that. So some ways to live with a, a less stress is to eat a well-balanced diet. A lot of our carbohydrates and uh, foods that gets, you know, readily metabolized, readily available, readily metabolized may not be the best thing for us. In your book, it, it lists a, a number of ways um, that's better to eat more healthy, not diet, but eat healthier than what we're eating. And these are all good, and these are um, the regimens that you should have if you have a 2,000 calorie diet. Drinking a lot of water, um, caffeine, alcohol, they tend to dehydrate us. So even though you're consuming fluids, it actually takes more out of your body than what's put in. Um, I love to watch shows where it talks about these countries that it's actually a law in that country. I was watching something on, I think it was Burma today, and it said one of their things, they don't worry about a gross natural national product, but a gross national merriness. Um, they actually, it's a law to be happy. So it's, it's okay to be happy. It's, it's okay to have tragedy in somebody else's life that you had to respond to and find ways to handle that and it's okay to be happy and have that balance in your own life. Other ways to prevent stress, spending time with friends and family, do things that, that you enjoy. Exercise does a lot of good. Three times a week, 30 minutes a day of something that's aerobic in nature. Um, a religious activity, having a higher faith. You know, believing in something bigger than us uh, plays a big role in stress management. Um, and you may need health, help from a health professional. We um, actually have critical incident stress management available to us. Um, we can organize this um, through the RAC, through different hospitals. And it's a healthcare professional along with your peers that listen to what you experience but in a non-judgmental way. Uh, and usually this is best if conducted within 12 to 72 hours. So within the first three days of whatever that critical stress was. Um, you know, you have a school bus bringing a group of kids back from a sporting event and it goes off the road and 
there's three kids involved in it. Well, the whole school is going to feel that effect. The whole community is going to feel that effect. Uh, and they'll bring in grief counselors for that. Workforce safety, recognizing that there's hazards to you and your partner as well as your patient. And did I skip one? No, I did not. And looking at these, probably the one that we fear the most is infectious disease. You know, there's people out there that uh, are HIV positive. They have meningitis. They have hepatitis. And you won't know it. They may be pretty asymptomatic. Um, so... You kind of have to treat everybody as if they have a disease and what we do with that is we use our standard precautions we call it body substance isolation or bsi uh, gloves even in the picture that you see in the top right of this um, slide you know the emt is wearing gloves on every call because you never know when you're going to come in contact with somebody's fluid and it's not a good time to start putting on your gloves there uh, they may have uh, airborne disease when they cough or sneeze in your face. So, you know, we carry masks to, pre to protect ourselves from that. Um, we have um, cleaning mechanisms in the ambulance so that we can decontaminate as well as clean the equipment before we use it on the next patient. And we always, always, always wash our hands. Bloodborne pathogens are just that. They come in contact, uh, somebody else's blood or fluids comes in contact with your uh, blood or fluids and the easiest way to protect yourself is wear gloves and be very careful with sharps at the EMR and EMT level There's very few sharps that you're exposed to Nevertheless, you know treat it as if, if it's a loaded gun if it's a dirty needle Which means it has blood from your patient on it You want to be very careful with how you handle that and make sure it goes straight into a, a sharps container there are hepatitis B uh, series of vaccines available that will protect you from hepatitis B, but there's also hepatitis C. Uh, there's no um, immunization for HIV. And when we get into airborne, there's no immunization for tuberculosis. It's an annual test that tells whether or not we've been exposed or carry um, the antigen for um, tuberculosis. We can wear a HEPA mask. We teach you how to wear this so that uh, if, if somebody does cough or sneeze near in your direction, you, you know, you're going to be uh, protected from this. But there's other things, just the common flu. I mean, the flu kills more people per year than a lot of diseases. So we want to make sure that uh, the mask fits good and protects you from that. Direct contact, um, patient contact of a variety of means. So your MRSA uh it's a, a multi-resistant, uh, it's resistant to a lot of strains of antibiotics um, and those wounds need to be covered, but you still need to be aware that um, if, you ha if you have con direct contact and exposure to that wound, there's a chance that you could have MRSA. So standard precautions, we always want to wear our gloves, we want to treat everyone as if they're infected. We may um, wear goggles, we may wear that mask, we may wear a gown, a lot of things that we may wear, but the biggest thing that we're going to do to prevent cross-contamination is wash our hands immediately with soap and water. The waterless hand soap is great until you can wash with soap and water later, uh, so it kind of buys you some time. Again, needles are a big culprit of cross-contamination, so don't recap them, don't cut them, don't bend them, they go right into a puncture-resistant container. And we have a skill drill um, in class on the removal of gloves to reduce that cross-contamination. Keeping your immunizations up, your flu shot annually. The flu shot is not a live virus, so you cannot get the flu from a flu shot. Your tetanus every 10 years. Um, five years, if you're, if you're a firefighter or involved in extrication, you're really around um, things that can cut you. Hep B vaccine, making sure that you're, you finished your series. Check the status of your varicella, which is the chicken pox. If you've already had the chicken pox, re-exposure could uh, mean that you could get the shingles, measles, mumps, rubella, and then your annual TB test. This brings us to a nice stopping place that we can um, call this part one and continue on with um, 